What is going on, everybody? Welcome back. I'm trying to help you guys get financing. You want to purchase a house, purchase a duplex, purchase a fourplex, whatever it is, we got somebody here to help you out. We have my man in the building, or not in the building, he's in the Zoom, in the virtual building. The, the What is it called now? The, the, the metaverse, metasphere or metaverse. something? <laughs> <laughs> we got Alberto yeah. Society, man. You guys give it up for him. Doesn't yeah. that, name, that name, it just sounds like, hey, I'm going to give you money. Doesn't it? It just sounds like a business name, Zasadi. Zasadi. Where, where is that? What's, what's, the, what's the origin of that name? I would like what's, to be in the back of a car somewhere, like a Ferrari. Ferrari. What? <laughs> yeah. uh, origin is Italian, somewhat German, but to be frank with you, my uh, family, or at least my last seven ranges of the media, it's all Hispanic, Americano. Somewhere along the lines, which I'm, I really don't know, uh, it's Italian and German structure. Yeah, it is. The, 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 it's the TI, like Ducati and the side. Yeah, I got Ducati, you. Ferrari, Lamborghini, all the idiots you want to throw on there. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. All right. So, anyway, hey, before we get started, can you just give everybody a brief? Uh, background about yourself, when you got started, uh, what you're doing, you know, how long you've been doing it. Go ahead, just give us a brief background. For sure, definitely. Uh, so back in the land where dinosaurs roam the world. <laughs> long time ago. Uh, long time ago. Uh, back in 2005 is really, literally when I started my career. Uh, so basically about 17 years roughly from now. I uh, started as a semi-lender, semi-realtor, uh, then kind of grew to the ranks of real estate, lending, loan officer, team leader, office leader, all that good stuff. Nice. Um, and then that was in the broker world. I made a transition from broker world to the banking world. Uh, there is where my re career really started to flourish and I started to get the wisdom and knowledge on how to really be a professional, not just be a sales guy. Uh, so in that world, I became uh, another, again, a regional leader, uh, an underwriter, uh, a processor, um, and then also just a relationship manager between different business partners. Um, okay. That was a good career chunk of my life, probably for like six, seven years. And then yeah. in the last three to four years, I've pretty much uh, been blessed by, by God to kind of see the business at a different level and just basically build my own company, build my own business. Right. Um, I've partnered along with some great minds who have a similar vision. And so today I actually run my own practice. I built my whole team around me, our, our flow, our platform, everything is built under my uh, structure and guidance. Um, so in today's world, um, I'm a mortgage professional that's got a team that backs them up. And for the most part, I believe mortgage is a financial puzzle piece that helps people's wealth grow. And so because of that, I kind of brand myself as a mortgage wealth manager. Uh, my job is not so much to give loans, but to help you build wealth through real estate and mortgage management, uh, which hopefully that made sense because that was quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. What, so what do you mean by that as far as this puzzle and instead of just, I, get, I, I mm -hmm. kind of follow you, like instead of you just, hey, here goes a loan, boom, you're looking to see, okay, does this make sense for you? Does Is this a good fit? Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah, of course. And and so to kind of clarify a little bit, and we'll try not to go too deep, right? Because that might be a full-on meeting in itself. Right. Um, right. So most of us spend our life kind of playing what I call checkers, okay? We basically move our lifestyle and our income threshold one box at a time going forward, right? And that's because we just don't know any better. Um, my parents taught me, they didn't know any college level, any financial literacy. So they just taught me, hey, graduate, get a good job, get promoted, get a house, get married, you know, just a checker type of lifestyle, which is okay. Um, but what I've learned from the experience that I've gotten in my life is that most affluent people, most wealthy, wealthy people, they don't play checker, they play chess with their finances. And they try to find movie financial puzzle pieces that move not just one step forward, but maybe five step forwards, or maybe diagonal or across, whatever the case may be. But every step that they do is to set up the next two steps. Okay. It's not really to move forward, right? Well, in, in, in my world, and, and I'm kind of one of the luckiest people to be, I don't know why, I mean, I will say I'm one of the luckiest people from the perspective that I see it and what I do in my role, because in my world, um, you know, if you look at the statistics, about 86% of most people's wealth, when they're gonna retire, it's actually in their home, in their real estate, yeah, right. not in the stock market, not in some portfolio fund, which those are great investment vehicles. Uh, I believe in good di diversification, not just, you know, one-sided. But I will tell you this, that most people when they retire, 80% of their wealth is usually tied to real estate. And so in other words, if you can learn how to manage 
your wealth in real estate and do it in a way where you're not too leveraged, where you're not too at risk, but at the same time, it's performing at a certain pattern, you can actually cause that real estate wealth to actually duplicate and grow even further. Most families get that wealth just by default and by accident. So to give you an example, uh, most people, when they finally feel it's the right time, they'll go and get a house and they'll live in that house, they'll pay that house. And then over time, five years, 10 years down the road, they'll realize, oh my God, my house has a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of equity. You know, I'm rich, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's in the dirt, right? <laughs> Uh, but that's what I call accidental wealth building. You had to live somewhere regardless, right? right. Uh, so the house itself built as well. And that's where most people kind of stop. They stop there because they don't know what the next step is to kind of have the same impact in the near future. So my, what my team does is we help people create lending, uh, but we do strategic lending where it helps them kind of build those chess pieces for the real estate portfolio. Um, to give you kind of like a summary of, of where we go. Okay, cool. Well, all right, well, let's get into it, man. Let's get, let's we got some questions. Okay, we want to know how can we get finance so that way we can start building wealth. So first question is this. I know everybody gets those letters in the mail. Oh, you're pre-qualified for this, pre-qualified for 100,000, 50,000, this, this, that, and the other. But that's not the same thing as being pre-approved. Can you just let us know what's the difference between being pre-qualified versus being pre-approved? That's awesome. That's a great question. So pre-qualification versus pre-approval. This is the biggest difference. Mainly it's a verbal component, okay? Pre-qualification, Brandon, uh, that's just gonna role play with you, right? Brandon says, hey, I wanna buy a house. I say, hey, no problem, Brandon. We might be at the coffee shop, over the phone, or even just a quick chat through via email. And I say, well, Brandon, uh, where do you work? Oh, I work for uh, Tesla. Okay, how long you been there? Five years. All right, fantastic. Uh, how much are you making a month? Uh, 10 grand a month. All right, cool. What's your FICO score? It's all right. It's like 750. All right, perfect. Well, Brandon, you probably could buy a house of like $2 million. You know, that's not really the right math, okay? Right, uh, right, right. But, you know, okay, cool. That right there is a pre-qualification, okay? It's all verbal, nothing verified. Got a pre-approval is the same schematics in a way, except that, all right, Brandon, let me see your paycheck that shows gotcha. that you are making 10 grand a month. Let me see your W-2 that you've been working with them for this amount of years. Let me see your bank statement that you got the money for down payment. And let's run your credit. Make sure that you're 750 <laughs> deal right. 750, right? So pre-approval is just verified with paperwork, but the both processes, pre-qualification and pre-approval are done by the loan officer, the, which is also the sales guy, okay? Exactly. Exactly. So, it's little, and, and so the pre, so it's it's the pre approval that you need when you're making an offer. I'm making an offer on the house that seller doesn't want to see. Oh, I'm pre qualified. They want to see I am pre approved. Correct. That is correct. That's what every buyer and agent out there for the most part usually shop with a pre approval. Gotcha. Now, as far as uh, the documents that are required, so I want to come to you get pre approved for financing. What is it that I need to submit to you? Good question. So. It kind of depends on the program structure, but we'll talk about your general mass market program, right? Which right. is your conventional loans or your FHA loans. Yep. In those cases, their rule, their guidelines is, is they like to see like a two year history, right? So in other words, from the income side, if you're an employee, you're going to be submitting pay stubs and W-2s. If you're a business guy or have rental income properties um, or self-employed, whether it's a 1099, like a handyman or whatever the case may be, or truck yeah, driver yeah if you fall in that category just know you're going to be probably submitting tax returns okay right, right so that's the income portion as far as assets for like down payment everybody's going to submit bank statements for that component um the lender will run your credit um and then separate from that if you own other property you have to provide documentation for those properties but in you know mass market usually is their first time i'm um, home buying so it would just be income docs asset docs uh things of that sort and I identification driver license, right. uh, whatever the case may be. Gotcha, okay. Now, when you're reviewing all this stuff, you, I, I submit to you my tax returns, my bank statements, my check stubs, et cetera. You run my credit. What is it that you wanna see to say, you know what, this is a legit solid person that will have the ability to actually pay me the money that I'm lending 
to him? What do, yeah. what do you want to see? Great question. So as a loan officer, I want to see a lot of zeros, right? But with a with a good digit in front of it, right? <laughs> uh, so uh, basically what the government agency wants to see, because they're the ones who put the rules, right? They say, this is the client that we want for this product. This is the client that we want for this product. And what they're mainly looking at is they're looking basically at credit and not just the FICO score. They're saying, is your FICO score in a fair range where it says that you're a good person for managing credit, but they also look at the history of the credit that you have. How long have you had that debt? Are you, have you been responsible with that debt? So that's one component they look at, that they're, that they're checking to see, are you a good payer? Should we let you borrow some money? Are you gonna pay us back, right? Uh, the second thing they look at is, do you have a job and is that job consistent to make those payments right, right. Um, and they measure that with what you owe and what you're making right because they obviously can figure out if you're gonna have money left over to pay them to pay the house right um, and then the last component which is kind of like um it, it's not it's kind of obvious right if you're gonna buy a certain house and you need a certain amount of down payment well they want to make sure you have that money and more important that you have had it that it, you didn't just find it on the street all of a right. sudden that's right. or i didn't just go borrow it last week and then my bank my bank account shows 60,000 bucks, but I went yep. out and got a loan, a private loan for 58,000. Yeah, that, that is correct. And the biggest thing, Brandon, that I would say is the reason these rules and guidelines exist, it's mainly to protect the consumer. The government has identified that if people can fall in this type of box, then technically they should not only be able to qualify for the home, but they should be able to own the home long-term, not just right. lose it a few years later down the road. I um, gotcha reason why they built this you know obviously we all know 2007 2008 crash at that point you just needed a heartbeat right okay give them a loan yeah yeah so with that being said sorry right, you so you, you told us what it is that you are looking for what you want to see what are some red flags for you such as you see certain things and it's like uh, I don't know if this person is the right person to be given financing to. Speaking again of the cookie cutter qualification, right? The yep. mass market, conventional yep. FHA, they tend to kind of look at stuff like um, foreclosures, bankruptcy, stuff on the credit like that, yep. uh, especially if it's recent, those are red flags for them. Um, if you have large- right, qu qu So question for you, question, sorry to cut you off. So is it more of a red flag to, to, to show on your credit that, hey, you, you have foreclosures and you have bad credit history. Is that more of a red flag or is lack of income more of a red flag? Like, is it better to have low income, good credit, or to be someone that has you know, a lot of money in the bank for a down payment, but your credit history is shot. You got three foreclosures, you filed bankruptcy in 2013. You know, you're 50 days late, 60 days late on stuff. Like what, what, what what's better? Yeah. So when it comes to mortgages, you need to, it's not just one or the other type of balance. It's technically okay. all of the above, you know? All right. Um, and, and, and so, and I'll kind of rephrase your question to you in a different way, right? Yeah. So having all these foreclosure, bankruptcy, all these issues, right? Basically it translates to not qualifying, right? But let's say if you had a low income and it was a perfect FICO score, we're talking about qualifying, but qualifying maybe for something under a hundred grand, right? So it's kind of like saying, is it better to qualify for a low price point or is it better not to qualify, right? Well, okay. neither is good, right? At the end of the day, because neither is going to get you into a home if that's the ultimate goal. Um, I, I will say you got to check every box off and you got to be at a, at a normal um, threshold, right? You don't have to be perfect at everything. You don't have to have the best job or the best credit or the best money. You just, it just has to be a, enough to what fits that person's uh, financial profile. Um, I mean, okay. okay. Fair gotcha. All right, go, go, go continue. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. You were telling us- uh... Fair score fair job yeah uh, you know, that's really the the, the, the the formula a balanced equilibrium across the board for okay. assets, credit job um, and income i got you okay what would also be something that's a that you don't want to see that's a that's a red flag to you that could that may possibly pop up during the pre-approval process. Um, another one that could be a red flag is someone who's had a lot of changes in their employment history in the last okay. two years. If you were an Uber driver last month, now you're a barista, and then last year you were you know, selling solar, and now <laughs> you're a truck driver as well the year before that. Like that right. shows inconsistency. Oh, you're unstable, you're unstable. You're unstable. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, and, and, and that's why they do those, when you have that type of structure, they, they do a full on verification to kind of see like, hey, where is he really growing his, his, himself, right? Is he taking these jobs because it's a career pattern growth? 
right? Because in some cases it might be, right? Um, but 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 that's the thing. You want to make sure that your stability as far as work history is yeah. somewhat stable and it's not too up and down and moving from different positions. Because that those are right. red. Doesn't mean it's not lendable, but there are definitely red flags. Yeah, and then I think also too, as far as the income for the down payment, you guys want to see that aging in the uh, account for what? Two months, three months. Like, what's what? What are you guys looking for on that? Uh, mass market program usually is like close to a two month period. Two months. That's kind of what they like to see at sixty days. I got you. Okay. So, is there any way that someone, let's say, someone does have foreclosure, they got some issues with their credit? Are there any type of any way that they can get qualified for something? Yes, there is. So separate from your traditional lending programs, there yeah. are other programs that is kind of technically a creative solutions, okay? okay. Uh, so just because someone's got a foreclosure or a bankruptcy, or let's say they're a savvy business owner who does really strategic tax deductions, right? To offset Uncle Sam, uh, yeah. you know, even that individual can get lending. But here's the thing, when we talk to that type of family, we do tell them, look, because you are technically like creative financing, you're not going to get the same market structure and market rate that everyone else gets because those right. products in the lending world are riskier because now the verification it's a little bit tougher right I so gotcha. so they offset okay. the risk sometimes with interest rate or sometimes with down payment okay gotcha so getting on so what what's um what are some things that somebody that someone can do immediately to improve their ability to get financing right I, you know let's say okay maybe they have some credit cards can they request a higher limit on their credit cards to make it to lower their uh you know lower their um uh, what do you call that what's that what's what's the name of that where you uh their usage ratio um like what are some common things that people can do to quickly uh boost their credit you know before they apply for a for a loan yeah no definitely and that's an awesome question that's something that we kind of give to our people who we put in a plan yeah. uh, for the most part and basically when you talk about credit usage you always want to be under the 30 percent of the limit okay right. no matter where your limit is at if you can borrow if your limit's a thousand bucks well don't use more than three hundred dollars that's 30 percent um and 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 if your limit is three hundred dollars well don't use more than a hundred dollars okay yeah no matter where you fall follow the 30 percent rule um also you read use the stuff that you're going to spend on anyway so if you're tight on a budget don't just go say hey i need to use 300 bucks because that's what alberto said i'm going to go buy you know new new shoes or new shirts like no reuse <laughs> stuff for like groceries you know for gas right like, restructure the same money that you're going to spend anyways but now leverage credit for it right gotcha and okay pay that off at the end of the month so don't just you know use the credit i put gas in my car and then i'm gonna go spend the money in my checking account like no make sure you pay that off at the end of the month right um, that component alone just that alone eventually will build your FICO score in a good way because it shows the bureaus that hey he's using credit under 30 percent and he's also paying off the full balance at the end of the month which nice. by paying it off at the end of the month you don't pay interest okay right. but it also shows that you have the ability to make big payments not just the minimum okay so that would be the first advice i would tell people always make 30 percent of the limit as your credit usage and if you need more if you show that activity they'll always extend that limit if you call or you ask for it yeah. uh, the second tip i will tell everyone is always 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 pay at least one dollar more above the minimum payment okay, okay. Don't just pay the minimum, even on your car payment um, or, or other stuff that has a fixed payment. If you have a loan and the payment is a hundred bucks, do 101, everything a dollar more, okay? It's a little small little adjustment, but trust me, those that little adjustment can add up and actually build the FICO score a little bit more. Not a ton, gotcha. but a little bit more. Okay. Okay? Um, and then the third input that I'll give in reference to credit is when you get credit, try to use credit that is global or, or at least national okay so in other words don't just go get credit at Kohl's because now you can only build credit with Kohl's so you have to go shop at Kohl's right right right, um, right. get like a, a visa card or a mastercard discover MasterCard. some you can use at different places you can use it at different places right that's, okay. the, that's the idea and you don't need 20 cards you just need two or three you know gotcha and yeah because you guys are looking at the debt to, to income and can, can you explain that just a little bit debt to income ratio because i know that's yeah. a big tool that yeah. you use you're determining so how much you that, 
So the government, they set up their own rule as far as like what they want to look for your income and what you can afford out of your income to live, right? right? right. Um, and every program has a different structure, but I'm just going to give you like a, a general explanation, okay? Uh, so for the most part, uh, the way the government looks at it is that, hey, you have 100% of your income. So maybe you're making two grand a month, okay? That's a low number, but let's just say two grand a month. Yep. Uh, well, they say, well, half your income should be for living. The other half, should be for credit. And so what they say is, if you're making two grand a month, then we're gonna take a thousand out and that's gonna be for living. That's for food, for gas, Netflix, Disney Plus, whatever it may be, okay? Right. And then the other half, we're gonna say it's for credit. That means your obligations for credit cards, student loans, personal loans, car loans, and mortgage. And so if you have a $2,000 income, that means that as far as for qualification, they're only gonna consider a thousand dollars of your income. And this okay. is gross monthly income, not net. Okay. This is gross monthly. So before, before the taxes, before the tax man comes and takes his, takes exactly. his share. Exactly. Okay. And they say, okay, so out of the thousand bucks, if you have a, a car payment for 200 bucks, well, now you only have $800 over for a house, right? If you got a credit card and the minimum payment is 100 bucks, then now you only have 700 bucks. And, gotcha. and so that's an easy way to kind of get an idea of what the government kind of structures things, right? But for the most part, you know, obviously most people are above two grand a month, so right. the numbers are bigger. But So I, I, and I have a question related to relating to that. So let's say, you know, I want to go out and buy a multi-family property that is four units or below. Let's say I'm going to get a triplex where I'm going to live in one, one unit and then two Two of the other units are actually occupied with people paying rent. How does the how does the lender factor in though the rent from those two units? Does that contribute to the income for the the, the borrower or what? How, how does that work out? Good question. So guidelines can change a little bit depending on the program, but okay. for the most part, they do consider the fair market rent for those other units. Okay, okay. Uh, and so they don't just give you the max amount because that would be you know an, uh, that wouldn't be right to the client or to the lender, right? Yeah. But for the most part, they do calculate a fair market rent, which is done through a process in the escrow process. Um, and then they give you 75% of that potential rental income. Gotcha. Every landlord knows that you always have to buffer in a 25% vacancy, right? That's why they do it. They only give you 75% of their rental income for qualification. Um, yeah. So that means that means that let's say if, um, you know, my I'm at, I'm at a thousand or two two thousand dollars a month is what I make. Then you're gonna take away a thousand to account for you know living expenses, etc. And so we're looking at you know a thousand. You're you're budgeting basically a thousand dollars per month that I have to spend on credit, mortgage, credit cards, etc. So that means if I go and if I'm looking at buying a triplex where I'm gonna get um two thousand a month in rent, you're gonna take seventy five percent of that, which would be about what sixteen hundred, and use that to apply towards the income that I'm that I'm making with my job correct okay yep and then yeah. now that income has actually elevated your price point as far exactly as board, but more importantly it's actually minimize your monthly obligation because now you got the tenants paying for your mortgage as well so it would so honestly it'd be better if you're a first-time buyer you can actually qualify for more if you are buying something that's multi-family residential um, as opposed to just buying a single family you can actually right. qualify for a higher higher price point that is correct and if you have a good financial professional that's a good advisor and understands like this chess model that I was sharing with you earlier, yeah, you can actually like really elevate your wealth um, uh, in the next five years. Uh, most first-time home buyers are usually in their early 30, year, 30 years of age. Yep. Uh, so they don't know what they can do and what tools can you use, right? Using a multi-unit purchase as a first-time buyer, it's not a checker move, it's a chess piece. Yeah, man, that's big. And and yeah. most people don't know that, don't see that because they just don't have anyone in their life to tell them, no, don't go buy a single family, go buy a duplex, triplex, quadruplex. I wish I would have someone in my family. I know, man. Tell me, you know, uh, it would be a different, a different, different situation. Um, but yeah, that's a hidden gem right there. You know, the only thing, the only other thing I can uh, think of asking is as far as interest rates, like how, how, how do you, how are those determined? Like what, what index and what, you know, I always hear people throwing out, oh, LIBOR, the LIBOR and the prime plus two. And like, what is that? Like, what does all that stuff mean in layman's terms? Like how, what are you guys using to calculate the interest rates 
that we see from day to day? Awesome. Great question. So this is actually something that a lot of even mortgage professionals don't understand in some cases. Okay. Right. And it's kind of one of the most fun things for me to talk about when I when we do consultation with all of our clients. And when we do a consultation, it's one of the funnest things for me to teach clients on how to understand how it works, because it's something that, you know, it's, it's never tough. And, and I, and obviously I learned it because it's part of my craft, right? It's part of my model, but to kind of explain it, uh, the program and the qualification can definitely affect the client's rate, okay? But at the end of the day, that rate and that loan is not being given by the lender, okay? All lenders across the board, we work under the, the guidelines of the agencies, whether it's conventional, FHA, VA, and so on, okay? okay? So we all play in the same league, right? They do the rules and we play under the rules. Um, well. Because that's the structure, we also have the same rates, the same programs, the same loan. The only difference is, is, is that lender telling you a nice pitch or, or are they telling you a different story, which is more realistic to what the markets are, okay? So just that's know it. that's how you work with lending individuals. Now, how does the rate actually work? Well, the best way I can explain it is think of the, the, the gas prices, especially right now. Yeah. Um, the gas price at the pump has a correlation with the cost of the oil of barrel. As the oil of barrel goes up and down, so does the gas station at the pump changes on right. a daily or sometimes on a, on a morning to afternoon basis, right? Well, mortgage rates have the same model. They're basically tied to a bond in the market. It's actually an investment portfolio and they're tied to a bond and that bond is basically open alongside with Wall Street and it can go up and down every hour or every other month. Right now, it's been going up and down like a roller coaster. And as it goes up and down, so does the interest rate yep. go up and down. And, and so that's how rates are determined. It's determined based on when you get your loan. So if you get your loan today, at one o'clock, you would get the rate today at one o'clock. Right. If you would have gotten it at 9 a.m., it actually could have been different because yeah. the market is that volatile right now. So um, okay. it's a little bit of a high level, but that's really kind of how it works. I hope that kind of answered the question. No, that answers the question, man. And hey, you're great, Alberto. Appreciate it. I know you got to run. You got other clients that you need to get financing. How can people find you? They want to get a loan. How can they find you? Yeah, definitely. Uh, social media is an easy way to find us. So if you go to CG Home Loans, that's C like a zero. CG Home Loans. Um, you'll, you should be able to see our handle both on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I have my personal profile as well as Alberto Zazzati. Uh, but CG Home Loans is the easiest way to find us. Got it. Okay. Well, hey, man, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And yeah, we got to do this again. Definitely. Definitely. Looking forward to it, man. Thank you so much. Right. Take care. Bye.